Hello, ITS Georgia members and guests. As you can see, we are still virtual at this time, but there's a good chance, so put this on the calendar, that our June monthly meeting will have an in-person component. We'll see. Our ITS Georgia board is continuing with their e efforts for a fantastic 2021. We have a lot of exciting things that are being planned and we will keep you informed through our many different media platforms. So stay on the lookout. Your voice is important to us. If there's anything that you have input on or would like to, you know, more information, get involved with volunteering, please do not hesitate to reach out to me personally and or any of the board members or even through our website. There's a couple of options. I do have a pretty long list of items to go over. So um, stay with me on this and I'll try to get through them real quickly. Again, visit our website if you miss anything. First and foremost, ITS Georgia is partnering with GDOT to hold two open houses that will highlight the traffic signal and ITS specifications, which have recently been updated. The first open house is held this afternoon at 3 p.m. So I know we have over 100 people, I think, that have registered for that. So please keep that on, you know, on your to-do list today. It will provide an overview of the new pay items and the updated specifications now available for traffic signal designers. The open house will also provide information that traffic, si that traffic signal contractors will find helpful for the bidding and construction process. The second open house is scheduled for May 26, which is also our next monthly meeting, and it will be right after it too um, in the evening or in the afternoon. It will provide guidance on how the updated ITS specification supports the ITS design and construction process. The open houses will be held virtually and will be recorded for your convenience. Our May meeting, so next month's meeting, will remain virtual in which we will tune in to hear from our local universities for an update. They have some pretty cool stuff going on, so don't miss it. At this time, June, July, and August are scheduled for an in-person component at City Springs with topics like a day in the life of maintenance contracts and Tim overview showing up on the agenda at this time. And another reminder is Ty Alexander with AECOM is leading the efforts in planning our 2021 annual meeting this year. So please mark your calendars to make the trip down to Savannah, Georgia this year on September 19th to 21st for this program with a theme of on the road again. My understanding is probably in the next week or two, you're gonna see more information on the website, registration, um, ready to go, of course, sponsorships and stuff. So be on the lookout for that. As we head into October, expect to see a joint meeting with Georgia ITE and our November awards banquet is scheduled to be back this year. ITS Georgia is moving forward with planning the Southeastern ITS Summit for next November, so in 2022. This will be a regional conference with ITS Florida, ITS Carolina, ITS Tennessee, and GRITS, bringing together eight states to showcase innovative ITS projects and products. Just yesterday, the summit released an announcement about the slogan contest, which included gift card prizes. Check your email or the ITS Georgia website for the announcement and a link to submit your ideas. And just maybe you could be the one to win a, a gift card prize. And finally, I want to thank all of you for tuning in today to our April monthly meeting of 2021, the fourth one, to hear about MARTA. But before we begin the technical side of this program, I want to present this month's sponsor as we cannot keep these monthly meetings and our organizational goals without our sponsors. A big thank you to past ITS Georgia board member, Billy Stalkut with 360 Network Solutions for your continued support with ITS Georgia. We look forward to hearing about you and your company. It's all yours, Billy. Thank you so much, Winner. Very excited to be a part of this, uh, this meeting today. And it's it's great to see everyone, at least in a virtual environment again. <clears throat> My name is Billy Stalkup. I'm president of 360 Network Solutions. And rather than go through and talk about the uh, services we offer, or products we support, or, um, or kind of, we, we want to do something a little bit different and just kind of take you through a timeline of what's happened since 2020 in the life of 360NS. And so we wanted to share a little bit about some of the programs and projects we've been working on. Um, and, and what that's looked like for, for us as, a, as an organization and member of ITS Georgia. So if we go back to January 2020, this was really, uh, this was the GDOT's Transportation Technology Showcase. And this was what I feel like the last time we all got together to really stand behind um, our partners like GDOT and MARTA. It was here where we got to really demonstrate some of the connected vehicle technology and transit signal priority together with GDOT and MARTA. 
Um, and it was a really a great opportunity for us to uh, to share and, and see how um, our, our our partners, our public partners, are are standing behind innovation and, and tackling major issues um, on on our roadway and public transportation. So fast forward to to February, you know, uh, February 2020, off to um, we're still in, the, in a real positive start with the year of 2020. We began work um, uh, supporting Georgia DOT IT and DTS under the, under the ITS um, statewide maintenance contract to deploy a, a statewide network monitoring system. We worked very closely in partnership with traffic operations and IT um, in the deployment configuration and customized dashboard of implementing um, a, over 9,000 network devices to provide really advanced monitoring and system health diagnosis. Um, additionally, this, this platform was integrated into the maintenance contracts ticketing system. So fast forward eight months from then, um, it's probably could have been expected in 2020 based on the results that uh, uh, this platform, although not GDOT's platform specifically, but was uh, under underwent a major security breach by uh, by an outside hack. Um, so that's just kind of just where the, the the tip of 2020 started to go started to go. March 2020, life as we know it, really began the remote work life. This is the beginning of, of a time which all of us had to adapt to in, in one way, shape, or form. Um, I know as, as, as our organization um, wanted to help our clients adapt and, and con convert from really in-person operations to a completely remote work life. And that was a, that was a much larger task, um, and especially for agencies like, like that we work so closely with like Georgia DOT as they migrated everything from their TMC to a complete virtual environment. We wanted to ensure that, um, that those operations could be performed um, safely and in an efficient manner. Um, things like control of the managed lanes, um, ensuring that they could, they could uh, support that operation and that program from, from a remote and not in person at the traffic management center. As we fast forward to a, a, a month later, April, Really, things are really setting in now, and um, I actually grabbed a snapshot here of, of Mr. Matt Glasser and his and his new pet D. Um, just joking on that, but this was this is what we we started feeling like. I know this it was the norm to uh, to be just really um, stuck at home and and really just feeling like you couldn't take it any longer. Happy hours starting at one o'clock. You know, it's just things just really uh, really started becoming the new the new norm and, and entertainment as we know it was really beginning to change as well um this was, was really the new norm of, of of finding entertainment i don't i don't know who's who's seen the, the this series but i watched it four times it was it was very very uh entertaining at, during this time also right this time you know we're seeing this battle between zoom and teams and webex and what platform is going to win out of of who is the platform of choice and uh, while we've all had our, our own experiences, I'm sure to share, this was one of my favorite moments when um, hearing about the, um, the lawyer who couldn't get his, his, his daughter's um, kitten face off of his face when he's presenting to the court. But uh, I'm sure everyone has their own, their own story here. Um, fast forward to July 2020. Uh, we began work with the Florida Department of Transportation on a really cool series of projects uh, to region-wide secure their network infrastructure and enhance their security of their systems. Uh, we worked very closely with District 1, District 7, and the Florida Turnpike um, to digitally secure and harden over 2,500 locations while providing region-wide contractor management and keyholder safety. Um, this was a unique project because this was really, we're seeing um, on a larger scale, um, state agencies beginning to adopt and, and enforce security policy um, which um, which we we all know and understand to be needed right now. Uh, September 2020, our, our virtual ITS Georgia meeting. Um, we really we really uh, appreciated that, and we really look forward to our 2021 meeting coming up this year. And while we missed that missed it out in person in Jekyll, we really look forward to uh, uh, teaming back up together with everyone in uh, Savannah. Okay, fast forward to October, um, another really cool project that we were fortunate to, to, uh, to participate on, again, together with the Georgia DOT, um, IT, and, um, and with uh, the ITS statewide maintenance contractor, there was a major network, um, network and device upgrade all the way through the downtown connector. And so this was really unique because not only was this was a, a lot of legacy um, infrastructure that, that needed to be upgraded, um, but 
we worked closely with, uh, with IT to really enforce a security policy um, using multi-factor authentication all the way out to the edge and the field device switch level. So when operators log into a, a, a device or a field switch, that authentication um, requires them to also um, use their mobile phone to, to um, confirm that it was them indeed that, that, that was at requesting access into that device. Um, additionally, with this, we saw a, a large expansion to Georgia's um, automated incident management platform uh, with the upgrade of uh, over 170 new devices coming online through this area, um, really enforcing and, and standing behind the, and promoting the safety of, of roadways and automation to the system. Okay, bringing it into 2021, we had the great opportunity of Carrie Lord joining us as, uh, as Director of Program Management for us. Um, we, uh, we're really excited to have Carrie on board. Some say that this was the best decision uh, that we've made since 2020. Others say that this is the best decision of this decade. Either way, uh, we're really fortunate to have him on board. The experience he brings and the program management um, uh, really, really focused on the client. Uh, we're really excited to have him on board. And I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't not uh, mention him uh, in, in this presentation. Finally, we're up to March of this year, 2021. Um, we saw the first state uh, statewide deployment, which uh, which we were awarded. Uh, for secured infrastructure and manage access across the entire state of Virginia DOT. And the importance of this project is this was the first state that really led in enforcing a security, security policy on a statewide level. Um, so we've been very active in working with their nine regional stakeholders uh, across the five VDOT districts um, to secure lots of um, uh, devices, but really provide that, that program management and, and managed access that's needed in securing their critical infrastructure. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, we are, uh, we're always happy to sponsor and be a part of such an awesome organization as ITS Georgia. Um, we, we look forward to continuous opportunities uh, of, of meeting everyone back in person um, or virtually as, as well. Um, we, we, we really thank you. And uh, Winter, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to you and, and uh, looking forward to hearing Marsha and, and the MARTA team um, um, present on their concepts as well. Awesome, thanks Billy. And, and what a good presentation, giving us an overview of, of what you've had going on over the past, year, just over a year. And um, cause sometimes we just lose touch with each other when we don't get to see each other. So that's great. Um, and now again, thank you for tuning in today to hear from our presenters, Connie, Larry and Ashley regarding MARTA, transit plan update with a focus on ITS programs. But before we pass the torch to those three, let me give a brief inter introduction to our moderator, Marsha, which I'm sure most of you know, but I still like to um, introduce our, our moderators. Marsha Anderson Bomar is the Assistant General Manager of MARTA, the Metropolitan Atlanta Regional Transit Authority for Capital Program Delivery. Previously, she was the Executive Director of the Gateway 85 Community Improvement District, and prior to that, the founder and president of Street Smarts Incorporated. Marsha has been active and played important roles on many different organizations within the engineering industry as, at both the local level as well as the international level. She has received many awards of honor, distinction, and recognition for her outstanding contributions and achievements throughout her career. Believe me when I say the list is long. She is currently serving her fourth term as council member for the city of Duluth, Georgia, and has been mayor pro tem three times. Marsha earned a bachelor of science in mathematics and a master's in transportation planning and engineering from the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn, and she also holds a Master of Civil Engineering from Princeton University. Marsha is the author of hundreds of publications, articles, and studies, and an international speaker on technical subjects, as well as leadership and ethics. She is also the mom of three, stepmom to three, has four in-law children, three step-grands, a 17-month-old granddaughter, and less than a one-month-old grandson, and with that, Marsha, I'm going to turn it over to you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Winter. It's so great to be with everybody. And I still hold on to those great memories of our last get together live and in person in Athens, Georgia. So thanks for, for uh, inviting me back and for including the MARTA team in, in uh, the ITS uh, Georgia world. So we, we have two presentations for you today. 
Um, there's so much going on at MARTA that I think would be of interest. Uh, so we really had to uh, sharpen our pencils to figure out what would be uh, the most connected to the, the types of technologies and areas of interest for the ITS Georgia group. So the two uh, projects we're going to cover, one is the Summerhill BRT, which is the inaugural BRT in the state of Georgia, and the other is our new rail car program. So I'm going to take just a moment to introduce all of our speakers, and then we'll hear first about the Summerhill program and then about our rail program. So uh, speaking today about Summerhill, we have uh, Larry Prescott and Ashley Licklider. Larry is a civil engineer. And uh, he's, I'll, I'll make you sound a little bit older. He's been doing it almost 40 years um, and has a, a very strong uh, multimodal background. He's worked at, uh, uh, for agencies at all the different levels of government and, and spent about uh, 13 years working with MARTA as a consultant, working on numerous projects, including our integrated operations and emergency operations centers, which I think is of great interest to, to the ITS Georgia Group, Atlanta Streetcar, and numerous other facilities and state of good repair projects. He came in as a, a staff member at MARTA about two years ago as a senior director for infrastructure, and he's, he's running up the ladder really fast. He uh, then became the uh, AGM for infrastructure and, and uh, engineering. And currently he is serving as the interim chief of planning, expansion and innovation. Ashley is super enthusiastic. You will hear that in her voice uh, every time you talk to her. Um, uh, very passionate about multimodal transportation and certainly uh, is expert in and, and enthusiastic about BRT. Um, she has a bachelor's degree from Virginia, Virginia Tech in civil engineering um, and uh, has been with Kimley Horn for about 20 years. They were selected through a competitive process to be our uh, consultants to take us from 30% design through to construction for the Summerhill BRT project. Ashley wanted to make sure everybody knew uh, that in addition to being excited about her workday activities, that she also loves traveling and biking, but mostly she loves shoes. So there you go, got to cover that. I'm all about chocolate, she's about shoes, there you go. And then um, speaking about our rail car program, we are really fortunate to have Connie Krisak, who is Marta's Senior Director for the Rail uh, Vehicle Procurement. When I first came to MARTA, and tomorrow is my second anniversary, yay. When I first came to MARTA, uh, I had the great good fortune to have Connie as the director of the architecture group, which was housed within uh, the department where I reside. And so we had a lot of time to work together. And one of the things that I'm excited about is Connie's passion for sustainability. She leads our program. And for those of you who don't know, uh, yet again, MARTA was awarded the uh, APTA Gold Award for our sustainability efforts. And a lot of that is really showcased in, in the great report that Connie puts together um, about all the programs that we do. Um, she has a very strong background in design and in transit. Uh, she does have a degree in architecture from the University of Texas at Austin, um, worked in the private sector for a while, and then went to work for Houston Metro. Um, and then later for DART, uh, the Dallas Area Rapid Transit Authority, and um, brought all of that great experience to the, the doorstep of MARTA and now is running one of our most uh, significant programs, which is a $650 million rail car replacement program. So big, big deal. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Larry to kick us off on Summerhill. Ashley will join him later in the presentation, and then we'll, um, uh, we'll pivot to Connie talking with us about the uh, rail car program with a, a little break for questions. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and at any time, go ahead and put those in the chat box and we'll do our best to, to cover those uh, questions during the, the program today. So take it away, Larry. All right, thank you, Marcia. Uh, as she kind of alluded to that this is a, an inaugural BRT for us. And it's right in the heart of downtown, as the picture shows here, uh, as we wrap around the Capitol there. And it's a very high profile project, uh, both for us as well as the FTA and the city of Atlanta. 
and a lot of stakeholders in the area as we transition through different types of neighborhoods and uh, the jurisdictions, so to speak. Uh, today, we're gonna give you a, just a, a good project overview, kind of tell you what, what we're doing here, um, covering the background, uh, show you a few renderings, then talk about technology, the stuff that you guys wanna hear about, and just uh, a quick update on the, the schedule and the budget. So background wise, uh, is part of the more MARTA program. Uh, it, the funding is, is, is through the city of Atlanta, but uh, MARTA is the authority working on the bus program. It's a 4.8 miles, so like I said, downtown Atlanta, and it affects multiple neighborhoods. Uh, we're looking at five modern uh, branded BRT vehicles, trying to make it look a little bit more like a, the streetcar, and we're looking at uh, doing electric buses to, on this route as well. And then, as I said, the, it's because hit several areas with the Georgia State, the government facilities, and all the neighborhoods along the corridor. So as you can see with our map here, I'll uh, kind of start down here in the, the lower portion. The Atlanta Beltline is at the southern end, and we have a, a transit to end of the line station there. We run up through the neighborhoods along Hank Aaron, up the Capitol, and then we work our way around the Capitol, along MLK, but within the, the vicinity of five points. And then we go around the corner, Ted Turner, and back to Mitchell, again, in the city of Barnett Station. Then we go back and we split the difference between City Hall and the state capitol, and back around the Capitol Avenue and south again. We have uh, dedicated, dedicated lanes to the majority of it. There are some shared areas that we have uh, just because of the residential restrictions we have in the area that we want to take too much right away. And then the 27 intersections that we have to affect here, uh, both for safety and uh, the transit, transit signal prioritizations. And then, as I said, the, the Georgia State and Georgia State, I didn't mention, but Georgia State, Five Points and Garnet is kind of the hub of the heavy structures for, for MARTA. So look at the amenities. Uh, our stops, if you've been on the Atlanta Streetcar Project, this is gonna look very familiar with it, with those. Uh, it's just an enhanced shelter. It's gonna have the amenities for our passengers, for the, for the buses, as well as uh, getting some real-time information. We want this to be state-of-the-art. Uh, along with our, our new off-board fare collection, security, and uh, like I said, the special branding for BRT, once again, kind of get us into that new differentiation of service. So here's just a quick uh, typical section uh, along Mitchell Avenue, where we have just a, a single uh, dedicated lane. This is a view looking east. And so we're gonna take the right lane with a bus only and leave the, the two general purpose lanes open and then we're going to take a little bit of parking, on-street parking, and put our stops along the edges there. And then switching over to the typical section, again, down in Hank Aaron, Hank Aaron on the southern end, we're going to have dedicated lanes in both directions. Again, the stops situated in community areas that, that serves the needs of the stakeholders. And we'll still maintain the two, uh, two current general purpose lanes in each direction. Now, technology-wise, uh, like I said, we're looking at electric buses. Uh, we're going to have charging at two of our maintenance facilities, and then we'll have an in-route uh, um, charger down at the southern terminus point. And uh, again, new technology. We, we currently have a pilot program that we are doing on the North Avenue uh, alignment of routes and with five buses there. So once those get uh, up and running, we're going to transition right into Summer Hill with our lessons learned. For you guys, the traffic signal technology, uh, again, the R in BRT is rapid. And to do that, we need to optimize the signals, the indicators, the priority, and queue jumping. And then, like I mentioned at the, the stops, the, the transit technology to kind of make the ride a little different and a little bit more amenable and new technology for our state of the art for our passengers. And here's a quick glimpse of the bus. We're looking at a 60 foot articulated bus. Again, similar to the streetcar, where it has the center transition, the, the little coupling there. And we're going to also incorporate a little bit more technology, not only electrical, uh, but as well as the DR, DSRCs to kind of have a, a general communication with all the TSB going on. And so you can see the difference here with the buses. Instead of the, the streetcar panograph going up, the panograph drops down from the charging station down onto the bus itself. So now I'm going to turn it over to Ashley to talk more about 
the signal technology. With Larry Settle, everything with bus rapid transit is really focused on making sure we can keep that route rapid, right? That's a, a critical component of BRT and important to making sure we enhance that customer experience and enable people to get to where they want to go in a quick and efficient manner. So as we all know, that involves a lot of different technologies, right? Um, signal optimization is, is really, really an important part of both the BRT as well as our general purpose vehicles, our freight vehicles along the corridor, our pedestrians and our cyclists all being able to safely get where they need to go. So one of the interesting things that you'll see coming up along this corridor that doesn't exist today are transit signal heads. So on the far right side of your screen, you can see an example of this. Um, that is a vertical bar at the top, a triangle at the bottom, and a horizontal bar at the top. And that's something that we'll have to teach our operators at MARTA to be able to drive to to understand the meaning of that new transit signal head. So you'll see those at locations along the corridor where we need to do what we call a queue jump. And a queue jump is going to allow some of those areas that Larry showed you earlier where we have stations, that's going to allow our bus to kind of jump out ahead of other general purpose traffic and continue traveling down the corridor in a safe and efficient manner. All things really to focus on saving time for our riders on the BRT. Transit signal priority is actually something we spent a lot of time talking with MARTA, GDOT, and the City of Atlanta about this morning. So there may be some folks on the call with us today that were part of that workshop. So as Larry noted, we're going to be able to use the DSRC radios that are currently in the Vita X deployment by the Georgia DOT and the Atlanta Regional Commission. We're going to be able to use those devices to allow transit signal priority at our traffic signal intersection. So what's really cool about that is we can accommodate transit signal priority much easier than we can with emergency vehicle preemption, right? It's a really nice way to give the bus a few extra seconds of green to get through a light or to give it a bus an, an advantage screen if the light's red to, again, focus on keeping our, our travel times consistent and reliable for our riders. So one of the really unique benefits that we do see with TSP systems are those abilities to reduce delays for our riders. So these are just a few of the different studies from the TSP handbook of different systems around the U.S. that run transit signal priority. Um, you can see some examples here in Tacoma, Washington, they saw a really, really big improvement. 40% is pretty spectacular if you think about every single time somebody gets on, on that ride, in addition to having exclusive transit lanes and optimized signal timings and those queue jumps, transit signal priority can add a real big benefit to our, our customers. And that's certainly what we're focused on is making sure that folks have a really good experience as they ride the BRT. We always do like to caution, um, you know, as much as some agencies have seen Great and giant improvements. Um, 10% is typically the level of improvement we're looking to get from our transit signal priority systems. And that, of course, varies, you know, when the, the traffic is really busy during our morning and, and evening commuter peaks and non-COVID times, you know, we don't always get that big a benefit. But over the general course of the time that the BRT will run, which is from five in the morning all the way until one at night, that's a really big benefit for our riders. So great way to just keep that, that rapid part of BRT. So we'll talk just a little bit through some of those awesome amenities that Larry mentioned for our stop areas. So one of the great things about BRT is the ability to pay for your ride before you get on the bus. So it makes it more like the streetcar and the rail system, right? Whether you're, you're using a, a ticket that you validated, a fair validator, or you're buying a new ticket at a ticket vending machine. This is just a really great way to make sure that when the bus pulls up that our customers can immediately get on the bus and the bus can continue without, you know, we have the, the delays and slowdowns of folks trying to, to pay. Another really great option um, that we're going to integrate into these stops is real-time traveler information system. So similar to what you see on MARTA Rail, we'll be able to provide the arrival time of the next bus. And as well, those three stations that Larry noticed that are close to MARTA Rail, we're also going to be able to provide a connection time of when your next train's going to arrive. So when you get off the BRT, you'll know if you are sprinting 
to your station or if you're just taking a leisurely walk. So that's another really great feature that we provide for, for customers to have that information. You know, we're in, in the age of technology, everybody's got information at their fingertips and always wants more information. So this is just a really great way for us to help people in their trip overall, not just on, on the BRT. CCTV security cameras. This is always something we, we keep in mind. You know, you, you want to make sure that everybody feels safe as they're, they're waiting on the bus and they may be doing that early in the morning or, or late at night. So MARTA has pretty clear guidance of, you know, coverage of the platform areas and making sure that we can, can see all of those areas. And that information will go back to the MARTA Police Department. And additionally, the, the video is also shared with the city of Atlanta. And emergency phones are, are another thing that is common on the, the MARTA rail system that's also going to be integrated into our BRT stops. Again, just to provide that opportunity for a connection into MARTA PD should there happen to be an incident. And the other great thing about the phones is they will allow for announcements if MARTA needs to share information with passengers, we'll be able to do that additionally. So just a few next steps as we advance the project. Um, as Marsha noted, I'm obviously very excited. I love doing BRT projects. We're really, really just very honored to be a part of this in Atlanta and to, to advance the system into implementation and operation. So final design will carry through until summer of next year. So just about a year from now. And then we'll work to get a contractor on board. This will be design, bid, build. Um, so they'll work for approximately two years to, to build the stations to improve the roadway. We're also going to resurface the roadway to do all of our technology. We also have to run some new communications, more than likely fiber communications to our stations with the ultimate goal of making sure that we're ready to take passengers on in the fall of 2024. And Larry, do you want to take yeah. it over on the budget? Yeah, so basically the budget, you need high level. Construction cost is right at $34 million. Uh, look at those electric vehicles running at 10 million. And we do uh, touch a little bit of a property here and there as we try to do some of the wadding and get, get to some safe streets out there. And uh, we do have the Tiger Grant funding in this. So uh, all together, our cost is just under 70 million right now. And that's where we're going forward with now with Ashley's assistance. So that leads us to the end. If we have any uh, questions, we can follow up with those uh, at another time or if you have uh, submit them and we'll be happy to answer them. Larry, Larry we do have two questions um, and you can answer them or, or if you want me to jump in, let me know. The All first right. was, you know, how was it that we chose this route? Um, so. Uh, yeah, the, well, I was there. Go ahead. Yeah. So the, um, there was an original proposal by the city of Atlanta for a slightly different route that went from, uh, Georgia State up to Midtown Atlanta uh, through both an internal process and a public engagement process. It was decided that um, that route was basically paralleling our heavy rail and really didn't uh, provide new service. In addition, that area is a highly congested area. And so as the inaugural project, it would be very difficult to demonstrate uh, success in, you know, putting that R in bus rapid transit. Um, and finally, um, the area from the Beltline up to generally the, the stadium area is, has really been um, underserved. You know, there was a bus route there, but it hasn't had the opportunity for any more enhanced service. And so through both working with the city and very much working with the community, uh, options were uh, examined to essentially shift the whole route south of the original proposed route. Of course, we work very closely with FTA to uh, get concurrence from them as well. And, and we think that this is a very, very important and much improved route uh, than the original one that um, uh, was proposed, especially you know, it's nice to have a, a connection to the Beltline. The other question, yeah, the other question we have, Larry, you probably can can uh, share some information on this, is uh, whether bikes will be allowed in the, the lanes. Uh, that is uh, certainly a discussion in process. Yeah, definitely. Uh, right now, our, our BRT policy that we're putting together 
uh, we're, we're trying to avoid having bikes in our lanes, shared shared lanes, uh, just due to safety and congestion of traffic. So we've been working with the the city and their bike coalition uh, biggest teams and trying to work out rerouting where possible or putting in bike path lanes parallel or opposite us. So we're trying to avoid the, the conflict with the buses at the same time serving the community in the area. So right now we're, we're working things out, but we're trying to, to keep it safe for everybody and come up with alternatives that work for all of us. Thank you very much. That's, that, that is a very important question and a very important dialogue that's going on right now. Um, Cause yeah, everything is, First and foremost, all about safety, and uh, everything else has to has to fall in line with that. Um, so, at this, thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, that was a great presentation. And if other questions come in, we'll we'll share them directly with you and, and try to get responses to the uh, those who sent inquiries in. Uh, but I know that um, the participants in the session today are also uh, anxious to hear a little bit about our rail car program. So we're going to pivot now and turn it over to Connie Krisak, who we've had to rein in because she could talk for three hours and still you know, be enthusiastic, but we've asked her to, to give us about a 15 or 20 minute uh, presentation on what's happening with rail car. So Connie, if you take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, so as Marcia had stated before, the, um, the Stadler contract for MARTA is one of the largest that we've ever procured. It's a uh, approximately $650 million for a total replacement of the entire fleet of trains that we now currently have. And they will be providing 254 new cars uh, for us. As we like to um, jokingly talk about our old trains as a, a brick with wheels, because um, to me, that's exactly what they look like. Um, and in looking at this, we are actually procuring exactly what you see here, another version of this. Um, however, with COVID and some of the impacts we had of, of delays, um, to think, uh, and mostly it was to our leadership, uh, Jeff Parker, he thought that this was an incredible opportunity that MARTA has uh, pretty much once in a lifetime, replace their entire fleet and make an impact to the environment and to everyone else. So um, Stadler uh, and I have now been working on um, new visualization to, to implement a new design for a more uh, aerodynamic uh, streamlined version of, of the train. Uh, and there's all kinds of changes. Um, in these changes, while some of them are aesthetic, um, most of them are, are things that the passenger will never see. The state of the art uh, equipment that we will get from the Stadler car is unbelievable. The reliability of these cars will be phenomenal. And the changes uh, that we're making that are impactful to the customer will also be quite visual. So for starters, we, we have taken the look of this train and started to um, design something that is more futuristic, more in tune with, with our ridership and more of what we want to transition into. As part of this process, um, we have developed a public engagement process because for us, there's really nothing that we should be doing without public engagement. Um, their input and their values uh, are what makes uh, MARTA run and MARTA thrive. So we, along with Stadler, developed about 12, 13 persona types in which we looked at people that travel with all kinds of needs, whether it's um, people that are disabled, disabilities in a wheelchair or uh, are, are um, visually impaired, people that ride with bicycles, people that ride with kids, people that ride with family and groups, with luggage, you name it, we looked at every possibility to start looking at needs. And how do we respond to those needs with a new vehicle design? It's, it's not about providing um, a seat and a ride. It, it's really more about providing comfort and safety. Um, 
we have developed so many schemes in trying to define the lights, define the aspect of how, how do we make the announcements? How do we announce the train itself as it comes into the platform? How does the train look as it's going down the trackway? Every, every visualization is, is being looked at. Um, even the cab, the, uh, the operator's cab becomes um, an intense uh, visualization, not, not just to make, a, make it a better work environment for the operator, also more visibility for the operator, a safer ride, and all the technology that I've um, addressed earlier um, is on all of these screens uh, where the operator will be will be having immediate access to technology and um, a pulse to the whole system. He or she will be able to know temperature, um, all kinds of information, uh, operational hours, everything that they can to mitigate any potential issue that would prevent the vehicle from making service. And back to the um, to who really matters. So as we look at everybody that uh, uses the train, whether it's the operator or the customers, um, this is how we start to respond. So we have spent, I don't even know how many hours, uh, internal groups for MARTA um, in looking and visualization of elements of what other systems have done. Uh, in everything, ambience, light, maps, seating, uh, bicycle storage, uh, windscreens, uh, telephone uh, charging stations, and um, trying to see how do we address all this? What do we like about something? What don't we like? And this is all in preparation for the public engagement. We are getting ready to kick off the public engagement probably, I would say, next week. Uh, with uh, a series of images, um, a series of questions, trying to engage them to tell us what's important to them, uh, what would they like to see, and giving them options. In this um, slide, one of the biggest impacts and changes to our train will be the ability to go from one end to the entire other end, all at the same time. You don't have to come out of one door and get into another door. It's all done internally. The, the cars are ganged together. Um, there's four, four trains that are um, linked together through gangways. So you'll be able to walk through. Um, and actually, if, you know, as a passenger, if say you're looking for um, a friend that's in that train, you can go from one end to the other until you find your friend, find a seat, find a place for your luggage, find a place for your bike. Um, if you're in a wheelchair, um, you will be, sorry, went the wrong way. You will be able to traverse, oops, to traverse the entire train um, to find a place to be. As you can see here, we have um, different types of seating. We have longitudinal seats and transfer seats like we now have. But um, in the different types of seating, it allows us to have um, a more uh, visible ride, um, an area for standees to, to stand and to be comfortable, uh, people with longer legs that uh, need a little leg room um, to have the leg room, uh, people that are riding in groups to be able to, to be together comfortably. Um, we are addressing things that our previous trains uh, did not address and, and not for any right or wrong reason, it's just that they didn't back then. But now we realize that the comfort and the ride of our customer is by far more important than, than just giving them a ride. Um, if you are disabled, we have a designated spot that is easy to get into, easy to maneuver out of, and is close to the doors. Uh, we, we want our passengers to, to be um, comfortable in getting to their areas and, and in and out and be able to visualize everything, whether it's the signage, the next stop that's coming on board, uh, or even um, be able to, to be next to the people that they're riding with. Allowing for all of these different options is, is what's going to make this train uh, an incredible uh, train to ride. 
Uh, we are going to allow for luggage to be clearly defined as to where it can be. Um, bicycles. We will have a special area just for the bicycles with a docking spot so that they can dock the, the bicycles in a, a secure area and not have to be uh, with passengers where the bicycle could possibly move and, and fall on someone. So now they have a, a special place that, that could be shared. Um, if you have a stroller, you can also use that area. Uh, if that area happens to be empty, you can still use that area as a standee. So it, it's a multitude of, of things that can be used for our patronage. Um, this is not what it's gonna look like, but it, is, it was just an option. We, um, we are in, uh, in the works with uh, um, an agency that is uh, a graphic agency that will be, again, giving us options for what this train may look like on the outside. And again, involving the public to select um, the aesthetics of the outside. Um, this is uh, an incredible opportunity. So I urge you that uh, go onto the MARTA website um, and there'll be a link there. Um, I would think Saturday or Monday that the link will be ready to go where you can start um, getting yourself involved and being part of this great design, giving us your ideas, giving us uh, what's important to you so that we can incorporate those into the final design of this uh, great train. Um, and I'll leave it uh, now up open for questions. Great. Connie, thank you. My video back on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Connie. I know that you had to restrain yourself because there's so much to share. But yeah, you know, I, I really appreciated your your comments and and the kind of the attitude going into this about you know focusing on the customer experience. And for those on the call on the program who don't know, uh, last year Marta established a um, position called the Chief of Customer Experience, um, and under uh, Rhonda Allen's leadership. Um, she's also established the Riders Advisory Council, and Connie um, recently briefed that group as well. And that group has a very um, uh, dynamic and diverse uh, set of life experiences and interests, which is really valuable to, as Connie said, to help inform us about, you know, I, for example, you know, I'm not. Um, a good candidate to tell you what it's like to navigate the system as a visually impaired person because I have good eyesight. Um, so having people who can share their personal experiences, um, you know, as uh, a writer is very, very valuable to inform the, this decision process. Um, we haven't gotten any questions from the audience at this time. So I'm going to uh, uh, ask you a couple of questions, if I may. So can you give us an idea of when the first car will be delivered to MARTA and then when, when the customers are likely to see the first cars out on the system? Do you have a general time frame? Yeah, we have a general time frame of about three years for us to get the actual first train. They'll be coming um, in, in monthly intervals. Uh, obviously, we, we won't be able to receive the, all of the trains at once, but in intervals, because once we receive a car, we have to test it and we have to run miles on it. So we have to make sure all the bugs are worked out. Any Anything that needs to be looked at needs to be taken care of before. This is way before we put it out for service for the public. So we'll be testing the trains uh, at night and running them back and forth, running miles on them until uh, um, we accept them. And then once we accept them, then we'll start slowly putting them into the actual service system. Great. Yeah, my understanding is it takes about a year for that burn-in period to, to test them and adjust things. And mm -hmm. that also helps inform you know, changes that might be needed for subsequent uh, cars. There's right. so many parts, you know, as a rider, it looks pretty simple to me. You know, I see some seats, I see some some poles, uh, I see some plexiglass sliders. But you know, when you when you look under the hood, if you will, there are, there are an awful lot of parts and decisions to, to making it work. Yeah. So, what do you, from a technology perspective, you know, is there 
Is there anything that we're looking at that's really more, I'll call it bleeding edge? The uh, operator cabin kind of looked like that to me, but I didn't know if there were other components that were uh, also pretty cutting edge. Um, the reliability uh, as a whole is cutting edge. Um, the components that are being used are, uh, of course, latest technology, but even in the maintenance reliability uh, of the vehicle, uh, we have systems that will alert us through vibration of every component and subcomponent of what the status of that component is. So through vibration, we're able to capture all that data, analyze the data and see when something that is minor is starting to fail uh, or starting to be impacted by something else so that in turn we can address it immediately and prevent some major catastrophic larger system from failing. Um, that in itself, that, that maintenance technology, the, the way we're going to address maintenance as a whole, the way we address system failure, the, um, we have all kinds of gauges that are measuring temperature that alert us again of any maintenance uh, issues or any potential breakdowns of any type of equipment. So instead of being reactive to when something literally breaks, and that's how we realize that, that we need to address it, we are being proactive in learning about everything that's happening way before something that is impactful to service and we can address it. The other thing to do with maintenance is instead of doing maintenance at scheduled intervals, we're doing them in short intervals very often so that when the train is taken out for service, we can quickly address something and address it then as opposed to taking that one train out for service for a couple of weeks to address a major overhaul. Um, all of these um, issues and all the way we're addressing the entire vehicle as, as far as maintenance goes is, is in incredible as far as state of the art. Yeah, technology driven. That's great. That's great. So we have two uh, really great questions that have come in. The first one is why do we still have operators? And I don't know if that's been discussed in your design group, but uh, I think that's an interesting question. We have operators, uh, they, they, they provide our, our visual uh, guidance to us to, to see what's on the platform. Could we run the trains without them? Um, yes, we, we possibly could. Um, not, not exactly right now, but we're very close to that. Although uh, it's a tough call on, on MARTA on which way to go. So why do we have them? It's, it's mostly so that they, they provide eyes to the system. They can, they can still... Uh, vi visually see uh, quicker uh, or, or be able to prevent something from happening quickly. Um, right. That's kind yeah. of in a nutshell why we still have yeah. them. Absolutely. And, and yeah, I think the other part of it is there would be a lot of other system and, and facility investments that would have to be made for us to feel that we have the safe environment to do autonomous uh, vehicles. And, and we know right. that there are places in the world where they do that. Um, we just uh, currently haven't uh, gone down that path of establishing all of that other uh, technology and, and equipment. And right, and our, our train, you know, the speed of the train, the, the uh, braking of the train can, can all be regulated. Um, Absolutely not by the operator. The operator is basically there uh, to open the doors and to, to make sure no one's no one is uh, preventing a door from being closed or opened. Um, it's more of a safety issue that that we have the operators for. Sure, sure. And I, a really fun question. So one of our one of our participants is interested in knowing how do the cars get to us? I think they're being fabricated in in the Salt Lake City area. Um, the shell is in Boostown, Switzerland, um, and then they will ship the, the shells um, to Utah. They have a, um, a shop in Utah, um, and they will finalize them there, and then they will um, truck them or ship them, I mean, uh, on tracks. We are still deciding that. Okay. But it's gonna, it, it'll, it'll be a long, a long haul. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And for those who may occasionally be on I-85 uh, traveling, you may see a rail car on a flatbed truck. We have some of our cars that go up to a facility in New Jersey for what we call a midlife overhaul. And uh, 
it's, it's quite a sight. I've actually um, been on 85 and seen one of the cars, you know, coming down the, the road. And it's, it's quite a sight to see when it's not on the, on the track. Um, so, well, thank you for that. Um, at this time, thank you for your presentation. It was really very interesting and it's such an exciting time. Um, Winter, I'll be uh, happy to share the link uh, with you as soon as it goes live so that if anybody who's participated today does want to weigh in on the public engagement for the rail cars, we'll be happy to do that. Um, there'll also be uh, some further um, public engagement on streetcar. So, um, you know, when that when we have dates for that, we'll certainly let you know about that. But with that, I want to thank you for the opportunity for Marta to, to share some of the exciting things that are happening here. And I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thank you, Marsha. Um, thank you um, as being the moderator and running this. And thank you, Larry, Ashley and Connie for your time today and providing us with great information on Marta's programs in our world of ITS with the Summerhill BRT as well as the rail car update. I'm um, also just love to hear that y'all got this community engagement. You know, it's, it's coming out of a pandemic and, you know, just to see that focus on bringing the community in, thinking about different people who will, the different people that'll be riding um, on the rail car and stuff. I, I just, y'all are doing a great job over there. If you do still have questions and, you know, do not hesitate to go to our ITS Georgia website and to the contact us portion, we'll do our best to get any answers for you that may have come up after this meeting. Again, a big shout out to this month's sponsor, Billy with 360 Network Solutions and his team. Um, thanks for supporting ITS Georgia. We've got a few more reminders, just going to go back over them. Tune in virtually today at 3 p.m. to hear the first of two open house series that will highlight the traffic signal and ITS specifications, which have recently been updated. And add, add the second one to your calendar so you don't miss out on it. It's scheduled for May 26. Another reminder is yesterday the summit released an announcement about the slogan contest, which includes gift card prizes. Check your email or go to the ITS Georgia website for that announcement and a link to submit your ideas on that and potentially win a prize. Please tune in to next month. We'll be back virtually on May 26th to hear what is going on with our local universities. Um, be on the lookout for an in-person component um, for our June meeting. Also reach out to me or any of the board members if you'd like to get more involved in ITS Georgia and one of our committees. We have a lot of exciting things um, that's going on and can definitely use all the help we can get. Um, check out, be on the lookout for ITS Georgia emails, social media announcements to stay informed. If you have any questions, again, um, contact me or go to the ITS Georgia website. Thank you all again for joining us today and please continue to stay healthy and we look forward to seeing you virtually next month, next month and hopefully in person in June. Thanks again. Have a great day.